So can the person in the back hear me? Yep, cool, great. So today's talk is about how to deploy machine learning models uh, to production frequently and safely. Um, I read this article saying, like, give a talk. Uh, telling, it's about telling a story, uh, changing people's perspectives, and inspiring you to try things out. So hopefully this talk I does that. I'm David, this is my Twitter handle. I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks. Um, so yeah, we are a consulting firm where we yeah, build software products um, and yeah, solve people's problems. You can find us here. We also write about machine learning and data things, data engineering, data pipelines, things like that. Go to ThoughtWorks.com slash intelligent dash empowerment. And so I want to start today's talk with a story about all of us. So let's say we have an idea, right? Build a NLP sentiment analysis model, or uh, build a Bitcoin price predictor, predictor, build yeah, a cats and dogs classifier, something like that. It's like, okay, cool, we can you know, Google these things and find things out. Our loss is converging, our prediction, our precision is 95, uh, 0.95. You know, we feel great, right? The model works, awesome. So show this to our friend, we take a screenshot, share it on Facebook. And uh, our friend rocks up to us and says, hey, your sentiment analysis model is really great. Can I use this? Can you, you know, deploy it for the rest of the world to use? So then we start thinking about questions that we haven't thought about before, like how do we uh, call predict without hitting shift enter on our Jupyter notebook? How do we transform user input, which can be a string, into a vector that our model can use? Um, so you know, these questions hit us, we're like stumped, and in the end, there are all these questions, and it, it is hard. So yeah, we are stuck, we don't deploy this thing, life sucks. And so before I go on, I want to take a quick temperature check with uh, everyone here. Who has trained a machine learning model before? Okay, about half the room, that's awesome. Who has deployed a machine learning model for fun? Okay, about one third, that's awesome. And who has deployed a machine learning model at work? Okay, about one quarter-ish. And who has the automated deployment pipeline for machine learning models? Okay, those three guys, they're awesome. Look for them after the talk. Fuad <laughs> Beck and Catherine Jong. Awesome. So the billion dollar, the million dollar question uh, is, how can we reliably and repeatably take our models from our laptop to production? So this is something to bear in mind throughout the talk. Hopefully by the end of the talk, I will have answered this question. So from our laptop to production, reliably and repeatably. So today's talk is about sharing principles and practices that make it easier for you and your teams to iteratively deploy better learning mach uh, machine learning models and share about what to strive towards and how to strive towards it. And we're standing on the shoulders of giants. These ideas are not mine. It's ideas from continuous delivery, which is a practice in software delivery that was uh, developed maybe five, six years ago. And these people have written about it. These are Twitter handles. You can go follow them. And these are also ideas, practices we've tried and tested at our clients, uh, whether in machine learning or just tr uh, traditional software. And to make this tangible, we have to pick a stack. So we purposely pick an uh, open source stack, Travis CI, um, where you, know, you just sign up an account, you have a free account, you can start building CI pipelines. A lot of shell scripts, uh, Python, obviously, scikit-learn, and Google Cloud Platform, which has a service called ML Engine. This is a managed TensorFlow serving framework. It can also be used to serve either TensorFlow models or scikit-learn SGBoost models. And so the back end is uh, basically an API you call. You, hit, you send a post request with some string, you get back a uh, prediction of the classification. So let's just watch a short demo. OK, so yeah, you go to, this is just a simple client. You type in something. This is the worst. The prediction, negative. Icon is awesome. Okay, so simple like that. Uh, at the back end, uh, ML Engine is serving um, a prediction. Yeah, zero. So um, this is the demo uh, that will motivate our talk today. Now, why deploy frequently and safely? That's in the title. So yeah, why? So why deploy, right? First thing, uh, until the model is in production, it creates value for no one except ourselves, right? Maybe it creates values for the people who are reading your analytics, uh, anal analysis reports. But you know, that latency is still quite long, right? Somebody's got to read that report. You know, uh, this can be days or weeks before it goes into action. But if it's in production, it's seconds. Somebody can use your model to get positive uh, net, uh, prediction on the sentimentality of your customers. Is someone angry? Is someone happy? You can get it in seconds, right? 
And yeah, I have a ton of models in my computer that you know I can use and nobody else can use. Them. So it creates value for me only, but not everyone else. And why deploy frequently? So we want to, as machine learning engineers or data scientists, we want to iteratively improve our model. Once we put it into production, we probably want to do it again to improve the predictions, the accuracy, the precision, RMSE, all these things. Uh, with new data, new hyperparameters, new features. And maybe we want to correct any biases that they have. And also there's model decay, right? So our model was trained from some snapshot of data from some time ago. And as the world moves on, as the ground truth shifts underneath it, it's not a way of that, right? So we have to, yeah, these predictions will get outdated and we need to fix that uh, by deploying again. And the most important thing is, if deployment is hard, we want to do it more often. So through this talk, we'll talk about why doing more frequently um, you know, can help us um, yeah, get to a more happy deployment path. And why care about safety? Right? So these uh, four things, one of them don't belong. A Toyota car, a car, a phone, and an ETH chair goes through extensive testing, right? In QA, QC, you've got yeah, people trying things out, the different parts, make sure it's safe before you put it up. Now, machine learning models, the ironic thing is that it has the biggest impact on most lives. And by yet, you know, we just look at the precision, look at the RMSC, it's like, okay, this thing is good to go. But in production, uh, this will impact lives in real time. And these are real people who have their loans denied or, you know, whatever kind of um, unfortunate outcomes because of our model. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I'll speak through this part a bit because uh, I want to get to the main bit. But the key thing is uh, the Hippocratic oath for us data scientists developers is that we should do no harm. Right? When we're putting out a model, then we need to make sure it's safe and any kind of biases is caught before it goes into production. And that's what today's talk is about. And also safety enables us as developers and data scientists to iteratively improve our model. If change is uh, scary, if you are afraid to maybe change some hyperparameter because who knows how it will perform in production, then we will start. We will stop kind of writing code. We'll stop removing things. We'll stop trying things. So if we have that safety, they can catch us before we make it into production. Then we can boldly refactor, boldly uh, try new features, things like that. So this is from a 2015 Google paper. It's what called the technical debt in machine learning, machine learning systems. Machine learning is that black box in the middle, it's the small part, but there's so much around it, right? Environment, environment configuration, data collection, uh, deployment and monitoring, things like that. And ironic thing is that we spend most of our time uh, on the black box, the machine learning box. Okay. So it can be reduced to do these uh, four bits, solving the right business problem, um, collecting data, data engineering bits, you know, getting yeah, your apps to send the right data to some feature store, and that will feed into our model. And most importantly, this model needs to be deployed to be useful. Uh, due to time limitations, we'll need to uh, focus on the deployment bit and how we can feed data back into uh, the pipeline. The goal of today's talk is to get us from this notebook, this playground where we're really happy, we're trying new models, uh, we're building 25 layer deep CNNs and all that. Maybe we make it to prop, maybe not. We want to get into a cycle, continuous delivery cycle where we uh, experiment models, develop, write code, and just with a comment and push, we will get this code tested, deployed, and monitored, um, and this cycle goes on as we iteratively improve the model. So, okay, David, I'm sold on this uh, frequent safe deployment thing. What does it look like in practice, and how do I, how do I start? So in the next slide, we'll share, in the next slides, we'll share 10 challenges and lessons that we learned from uh, continuous delivery principles. Hopefully these uh, practices that you can take after this talk and apply as well. Our story's main characters are Mario, the data scientist. He's very crazy. He will uh, do jump over fire, jump over nails, whatever it is to get the models, precision to be, or predictions to be accurate. Right? He will, yeah, eat mushrooms, whatever. And we have Luigi, the engineer, who is, you know, doing farming work, and uh, usually people don't know that he exists. And because this is a rough overview of what we'll talk about. It's the main vehicle concept uh, we will talk about, so I've spent some time talking about it. This is the, what we call the continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. Continuous integration because we are continuously integrating code. Uh, you commit to Git, and we want to make sure it's tested and it works. And at, at every stage, we want to, it solves a different problem. We'll talk about in detail what those problems are. But, um, and then continuous delivery because we are continuous delivering models. Um, yeah, they are better and ready to go to production. And 
If you forget anything about this talk, just remember that CI/CD is about feedback. If we get feed, if we do something bad in the, we want our test to catch it and tell us within minutes of pushing. If we are train a bad model, we want to have it tell us within half an hour, an hour. It depends on how big the model is, how much data you have. You want to tell us, give us the feedback within hours, not when something is in production and discriminating our people. So it's all about feedback. So challenge number one, snowflake uh, environments. It's snowflake because uh, every snowflake is unique. You can never recreate the same snowflake, right? And uh, works on my machine problem. So uh, Mario creates a crazy uh, deep learning model. He says, okay, this is awesome. This works for my data. Sends it over to Luigi, and Luigi takes it, clones it, runs, train, boom, import error. TensorFlow is not found. You know, things like that, right? We've all faced this at some point. We take somebody's code and, you know, the, yeah, we face these problems. So the solution is uh, automated configuration management. So the idea is that your teammate or someone should be able to rock up to a laptop, clone your repo, run one command, and have the whole environment set up. All your dependencies, configuration, everything should be done. So uh, you can use various tools, Conda, Docker. For this demo, we just simply use Conda and shell scripts. Yeah. And anyone can clone this repo and try to solve. You want to version control your dependencies. And the benefit of this is that uh, you get production-like environment early on. If there's any issues you'll face later on, let's say TensorFlow 1.7 doesn't support blah, 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 you find it out immediately on your laptop right now, not weeks later when you try to deploy these things. It also enables experimentation by data scientists. You have a sandbox environment where, yeah, data scientists can write code, and this will be integrated, and it can be shipped. So we have a brief demo of what the setup script looks like. Uh, it's just a shell script. Essentially, it's doing four things. Install system level dependencies. Number two, create virtual environments. Then install project dependencies and specify any kind of configuration. Uh, okay. So, of course, this is just comments. I don't want to show you the resource because it's like 100 lines long. But uh, you get the idea. Somebody rock, rock to the laptop, run setup. And this is faster because I've run it before. And yeah, you're ready to go. <laughs> you virtual, you activate your virtual environment. And you have an environment where you can start writing code and committing to trunk and pushing production. Okay, challenge two. So how can I ensure that my changes haven't broken anything? And how can we enforce the goodness of our models? Right? It's kind of trust-based now. Maybe I rock up to a laptop and I start dropping a column, changing the pipeline here and there. It's going to work for my model, but have I changed or broken something for my teammate? So we don't really know. And what if I push a model that has you know, really poor accuracy you know, because of whatever reasons? So the solution for this is what we call a test pyramid. It's the pyramid analogy is about quantity. Right? So at the bottom, you have your unit test. It's high in quantity because it's fast to run. You can run hundreds within a minute. And if you have any external services talking to you, you need integration tests. And we've added this layer called the ML metrics test. So this is basically going to a, unit, a test that will check the precision or accuracy or whatever metrics that you care about, RMSE, whichever, before. Uh, and if it's lower than your stated threshold, it will break the build, it will fail, and uh, you won't be able to push this thing to production. And the benefit of this is fast feedback. Before I even commit, I'm running this test, and I know that, oh, I've accidentally broken my colleague's code. Now let me fix that. Thing. <coughs> and the safety harness allows us to uh, continuously refactor and make the code more maintainable, extensible, and scalable. So this is a simple demo. Um, it's just a shell script that calls the unit test script, and then calls the, um, uh, the metrics test script. It's really small, I apologize. That one dot is a uh, one unit test for demo purposes. And now this part is a bit longer because it's loading the model from Pickle, uh, running against large amount of data. And that one dot means precision pass, accuracy pass, because now it's just 0.85. I'm going to artificially change the threshold to 0.99. And we can see that when the model is not good enough, uh, it will fail. So, yeah, so it says precision of 0.94 is below threshold of 0.9. So this way, you know, you will, you will know whether your, when your model is not good enough. And next challenge, 
So not everyone may run this test, right? Um, goodness checks are done manually. And we, as a result, we could deploy bugs or errors, or worse, uh, biased and bad models to production. So here we have a problem, right? We've made it past that, we've committed, gone to VCS, our version control system. So the solution for this problem is what we call a CI pipeline, continuous integration. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this concept, so I'll move a bit faster. This basically automates your unit test, train test. Our test pyramid, all the good things we had, um, this will be tested and triggered to every commit. So we don't forget things. If we do forget things, CI will tell us, we get a feedback within minutes, uh, not when it's production. Yeah, every code change is tested, assuming we have unit tests. And source code is the only source of our software and our models. Okay, so every model can be traced back to our uh, commit. So we know, okay, this commit produced something bad, something, something really good, we can all trace it backwards. And I have a brief demo uh, for people who are new to CI as a concept. I just make a dummy commit, just a new line. I add it, commit it, and we can see that the pipeline is automatically triggered. So we've cho cho uh, chosen Travis CI just to illustrate that a simple tool can do what we're describing. So you can choose something more sophisticated like a Go CD or yeah, whatever else you have. Yeah, so it's automatic trigger. It's going to run your unit test, your uh, model metrics test, and deploy it to staging if everything passes. If along the way anything fails, it will not go on. It will stop. You get the feedback. Say, oh, I got to fix my metrics test. You know, things like that. It won't deploy even if something is wrong. All right, so fourth challenge. How can we revert to previous models? Right? Let's say your boss rocks up to you and says, hey, uh, our model is doing really bad this month. Can we go back to the one from two months ago? 10th March, I remember that was really great. So you gotta think, oh man, what were the hyperparameters? Uh, what were the data I was trained on? And things like that. <coughs> and also retraining is time consuming. If your model takes half an hour or even, yeah, hours to train, then you gotta wait that long. If that's a bug in production, maybe you can't wait like that. And also manual renaming of these models can, are error prone. I think it was last month, uh, Travis CI dropped all his users from the database because of one environment variable was pointing to prod instead of QA. So you know, even simple things like that, small things which we are, we are human, right? we make mistakes. So anything manual can lead to errors. And yeah, so we want to make sure each model that's trained and produced by the pipeline, this artifact, is versioned. So, meaning we put it in a directory somewhere. So for us, we use a Google Cloud Platform bucket. We store it there, give it a name, um, time, tell it, okay, you attach metadata, right? What data it was trained on, what have parameters, things like that. And so, yeah, you have the artifact. Next time, if there's a bug in production or whatever, you want to revert to this model, you simply serialize this, uh, Take this artifact, put it in production. You don't need to retrain, you don't need to worry about these manual steps. Now you save on build times, and your confidence in your artifacts uh, increases down the timeline. Right? You don't have to start again from scratch and think, hey, do I, I'm not confident in this retrained model. I need to go again to QA, I need to do the edge case testing, things like that. Right? So the next challenge, uh, deployments can be scary. Um, and manual deployments, like I said just now, can be a potential for mistakes. Right? And oh, I have a roadmap here, so just to trace where we are at. We've gone to dev, VCS, unit tests, train and test, all these are run. We've version our artifacts, now what's next? So now the next thing is to deploy this artifact. So this is uh, using the CD pipeline for automated deployment. Um, and deployments are triggered by the pipeline, automated, so there are no source or potential for human errors or limited source of errors. And it's a single command deploying, deployment to staging or production. So because deployment to production can be scary, we want to rehearse it. The more we rehearse, as I said, you bring the pain forward, the more you do it, the, more, the less fear you have and the more confidence you have in that it will work because we've seen it work all these number of times. Right? And in terms of disaster recovery, it's simply rolling back to the last good model. Okay, we can see a diagram of this. And you can do this on any tool. We've chosen Travis CI. This bit is a unit test. After it passes, okay, train the model. 
evaluate it. So just a shell script to get data, train, evaluate, and then upload this artifact. And deploy the staging is simply one shell script. And essentially, we're using uh, ML Engine, which makes this uh, quite easy. Uh, ML yeah, Engine versions create. So you create this model, you say what artifact to use, and yeah, we're using Scikit-learn as a framework. And this thing is deployed, right? So, and to deploy to production is simply switching out. We have various candidate models. It's simply changing the pointer of the default production model to a candidate model. Okay, now we've deployed the staging, and what's next for us? We're about to deploy the prod, and so how can we know if we're going to deploy a better or worse model? We have seen the metrics, okay, we've stress tested, but is it better than the previous model? We don't really know. So we have to monitor this candidate model that's about to go to production. It's a technical canary release because it's taking inspiration from miners. Before they go down to a potentially dangerous coal mine, they bring down a cannery. And if the cannery makes it back alive, awesome, we're ready to go. Okay? So I don't want to tell the sad part of the story. <laughs> so uh, a solution for this is uh, called requested, request shadowing pattern. So we're going to credit yeah, Rajesh uh, from Index for this idea. I'll show you what it looks like. So a client comes to your app, makes a request, say, okay, I say, PyCon is awesome. Okay, then your model needs to say, what, is it a positive or negative sentiment? So in our app, we have a router. Router will forward this request to the real model. Model will say, okay, PyCon is awesome is class one, okay, it's positive. At the same time, the router will forward this model to various candidates. And each candidate's predictions is locked, and this lock is aggregated, stitched together, and you can monitor it. Right? So you can see that, oh, in real time, uh, our pr production model is actually doing worse compared to, let's say, candidate number V10. So we know, okay, we have confidence, V10 can go to production. Okay, so, yeah, once we, once we monitor that, we can have the um, pr confidence to release that to production. Okay, so now, um, We've talked about a lot of things, right? It can be scary, and there's also complex models can take a long time to develop and to debug. Let's say, you, yeah, again, that 25 layer CNN, you know, like you get it, but uh, your colleague who's trying to understand it also, his head explodes, right? Definitely my head explodes. And also, to getting all the right features can take weeks or months, right? Let's say we want this model to work from the get go, we need, yeah, 20 features. So we can't get, always get better. Right? Engineering needs to, you know, spend time to. Uh, instrument this data. So the solution for this is to start simple. So in continuous delivery, there's an idea called a tracer bullet pattern. The idea is that if you want to, let's say, build a world-changing blogging app, right, like Medium or something, you start simple, you deploy, let's say, a hello world or a simple article to production. So in doing that, you set up your CI pipeline, your CD pipeline, you run your unit test, you run your whatever else test, you deploy the staging, deploy production, Set up, get a solid pipeline, start with simple models. In our machine learning context, you start with a simple model with simple features. And then after that is set up, subsequent changes to your features, to your model, is simply changing it, testing locally, commit and push, and all of that goodness that we just described is run automatically, and it improves our velocity that way. So, so we discover any integration issues along the way, uh, sooner rather than you know, three weeks later when we realize that, yeah, you know, whatever issues. And most importantly, we demonstrate working code to our stakeholders faster rather than later. So if, let's say, business comes to you and says, hey, I need a machine learning model to predict sentiment. Right? So you spend weeks or months developing this thing, and then you ship it finally, and they realize, oh, I don't need a zero or one classification. I need a yeah, five class classification. Right? So then you have to restart. <coughs> so when we do tracer bullet, we can get that feedback faster. Right? We deploy a simple model, they can start giving feedback to say, hey, this was really useful, or hey, uh, you know, we just need to change this part. So tracer bullet helps us there. Yep. And the eighth lesson or challenge is that data collection is hard, we all know that. And machine learning, garbage in, garbage out, right? The solution for this would be to collect more and better data with every release. As machine learning people or data scientists, our job is not done when we serve that prediction. After serving that prediction, we need a way to gather that ground truth. Was my prediction correct? Uh, so once we have that label, we can feed it back to our training data and 
Now the next iteration we have more and better data for our model. We get better models. And so you can create bug reports for your clients, maybe a vote up, vote down, things like that. Create a feedback channel for your yeah, clients or users to generate better training data for you. So a word of caution here is to uh, um, be aware of attempts to gain your machine learning system. If some yeah, bad guy wants to you know, skew your data, he can do it. So maybe try rate limiting or random sampling, things like that. And so the idea is to complete the data pipeline cycle and yeah, keep iterating. The ninth challenge, how can we do all of the above? Now David, you said a lot of things and yeah, it sounds scary. How do we start? What we've seen working with our clients is cross-functional teams of data scientists, data engineers, software engineers, uh, UX people, business analysts. Um, the benefit is that you get less nails, right? When you're a hammer, everything is a nail. So when you have a diverse view about user experience, about business analysts, about deployments, then naturally you will discover problems even during the development phase. So I've tried to you know, do everything myself, but I realized that there's only 24 hours in a day, eight hours in a working day. So it's best to you know, build a team and do it as a team to leverage different competencies. Also improve empathy means a happier team. You know, it's no longer data scientists write 25 layer C and then throw it over to data, uh, you know, the software engineer. It's kind of them pairing together, pair programming, and learning about each other's uh, you know, yeah, work, how they solve problems, things like that. So yeah, you get growth as a byproduct. Right? And so yeah, how can we do all this above again, right? I maybe don't have money to you know, train or get build a team or whatever. Um, so the solution is a Kaizen mindset. So Kaizen is a Japanese word. Uh, in Chinese, it's Kaishan. It means uh, change for better. So as a team, you can go through with your team a uh, deployment checklist, deployment health checklist, and we iteratively get to good. So this is one such checklist from a 2016 Google paper. So you can go through, say, software engineering practices. Are we using source control? OK, check, awesome. Are we writing unit tests? OK, check, awesome. Do we have a CI pipeline? OK, no, this is something we need to work on in our next delivery uh, sprint. So we can go through this as a team. And at the end, you can ask your team, do a health check. Like, how much time does, does it take to deploy a model from staging to production? Is it an order of minutes, hours, days, or weeks? And how much calendar time does it take to add a new feature to the production model? Again, what's the order of time taken? And I know I'm running short of time, but this is a really awesome video, and I want to show you. It's about the real battle between um, data scientists, engineers, and yeah. Anaconda's installed, 
Everything looks like it worked. It's still perfect. It's still in the sandbox. We have to get to the production cluster. <laughs> It's GDPR, but we don't have to worry about that until next month. Do this, I get to go home. Because we're trapped in a dream world within a dream world? No, because my son has a soccer game at 6 and I need to get a jump on traffic. There's no GPUs available. Come on, it looks like the IT guys are using them to mine Bitcoin? <laughs> And Bitcoin has really become a sediment layer and not a currency. Dogecoin is- Shut up! Enough with all the stupid coins and cryptocurrency hype! You're gonna overfit! This was show that Anaconda Con, yeah, the guys did a great job. <laughs> so, conclusion, we've, what we've gone through is uh, typically in software engineering what we call the CI-CD pipeline. You start from a local environment, you push the version control, you, you, you run tests, different layer of tests, tests that take longer and longer to run, you get that fast feedback. And you know, by the time you are about to deploy to production, you have a list of candidates which you know, you're confident, you have metrics to back your confidence to go to production. And this, yeah. So we don't have a machine learning problem. We have a business, a data, a software delivery, machine learning UX problem. So we want to solve the right problem. Um, we've talked today about deployment and monitoring. So yeah, hopefully next PyCon somebody will talk about data collection. That'll be really interesting as well. And we've shared 10 tips on how to deploy models frequently, safely, reliably, and repeatedly. So thank you. And we are hiring, uh, so if you are a developer, data engineer, you're welcome to join us. Uh, UX people, we are also hiring, and information security. We have a booth outside, so come and speak to us. Thank you. And these are uh, links, yeah, can we? Thank you, David, awesome talk. Uh, do we have questions? Not about the movie, about the talk, right? <laughs> Hi, awesome talk. So, Thanks. quick question on your tannery models. Mm. I was just wondering, like, when you're actually live in production, you have your champion model and you have, let's say, three tannery models. So, when your actual data comes in, you don't really have the labels for those mm -hmm. for, for those data. You don't know whether they're right or wrong. Mm. So, if your if your data coming in on day one is just like ten predictions, you can take a look at that. But if you have one hundred predictions or if you have one thousand predictions. How are you going to know? Yeah, so that's exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, so you need to, yeah, it's a data engineering problem. You need to stitch together labels, collect them first, and yeah, through that pipeline, have a test data set that you can run against yeah, your, your uh, models. So about, yeah, about that monitoring dashboard, I think it was a bit subtle, but there's a little pipeline there to abstract away the complexity. So this little thing, you have to fix yeah, they somehow stitched together data to be visualized. May not be in real time, but yeah, you visualize it eventually. Thanks. Any more questions? All right. Hello. Great talk, David. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, uh, are you aware of any other open source tools that will do the model ver version control of your different models? How about from TensorFlow serving? Like, not everyone can you know, kind of offer it. Yes, that's a good question. So um, there's no technology specific solution. This is just putting your model binary, a pickle, in a bucket, cloud bucket. So it can be S3 bucket, it can be GCP, it can be somebody's laptop or VM. Um, it's about just copying it there and automating the labeling and the naming so that you have yeah, all of that artifact version. So it's not magic, it's just a cloud directory. Okay, I think that should be it for questions because we need to squeeze in Lovely's talk as well. Um, thank you again, David. Let's have a, another round of applause for David. Um,